Let's talk biological signaling. Much more detail than you probably want to know, but hey, don't say I didn't tell you so. All kidding aside, it's really important that your cells are able to respond to extracellular cues. Things like small molecules like hormones binding, things like changes in voltage or light. All of these various things are signals that something is going on, and your cells need to be able to respond. You'll want different cells to be able to respond to the same signal in the same way. But you also want them to be able to respond to the same signal in different ways. And you'll want them to be able to respond to different signals in the same way. So things get really, really complicated. We can kind of simplify things down by thinking of the kind of there being four main types of signal transduction, or basically ways in which our cells take an extracellular cue and transmit that information inside into the cells and often all the way into the nucleus so that they can kind of control the transcription of genes. By controlling the transcription of genes, you're thus able to control the production of messenger RNA, and the amount of messenger RNA is going to regulate how much protein gets made. And so by turning things off at this faucet, by turning off that transcription, you're therefore able to kind of really halt the production of various proteins or start the production of various proteins. But that takes time, and so we'll see that we're also going to have lots of levels of regulation on the way to the nucleus. So let's talk about how we actually get those signals all the way to the nucleus or to other places. How do we actually transmit those signals throughout the cell? We can talk about four main types of signal transduction, our G protein coupled receptors or our GPCRs. We'll get a lot more into detail about a classic example, the beta adrenergic receptor. We also have our receptor tyrosine kinases, or our RTKs. This includes things like our insulin receptors, our growth factor receptors. Um, these are going to be very important receptors as well. So in those cases, we had these receptors that kind of went through the membrane and they bound to a signal on the outside or they somehow responded to a signal on the outside. So often we're talking about the binding of a small molecule called a ligand, and we can call these basically these ligands, these external signals, we can call them primary messengers. Later we'll see how these primary messengers can lead to changes that lead to the production of secondary messengers, which are going to be other small molecules that are actually going to act inside of the cells. Whereas the primary messengers, those are like the hormones that are binding on the outside and helping through this transmembrane protein receptor transmit that message into the inside where they can then lead to the production of those secondary messengers, which can then go and take that message all the way throughout the cell in various fashions, depending on what they're kind of like hooked up to. So we'll see that basically you can have a lot of modularity in these pathways and branch points and things. And we'll see that cells can kind of control what happens in response to a signal by controlling what sorts of signaling molecules are, are hooked up, scaffolded together in the same place, made in the same cells in the same time. And so we'll get more into how this can happen later, but spoiler alert, it's mediated a lot by phosphorylation and the creation of distinct binding sites through the addition of phosphor, um, phosphoryl groups. So we'll look at GPCRs and RTKs in more detail, but I want to get a couple of the other types out of the way. These kind of um, less receptory, I guess, um, less complicated systems, you might say, because they don't have as many players in the game. These are ones that we actually talked about a bit when um, the third one's gated ion channels. We actually talked about these a bit when we were talking about our membrane transport. Our gated ion channels, remember when we're talking about a channel, we're talking about passive transport. We're talking about going in the direction of the gradient, so of our electrochemical gradient. Remember that ions aren't just going to aren't just going to diffuse freely through a membrane because they're positively charged or negatively charged. Basically, they're charged, and that membrane is like that hydrophobic um, inside. Those charged molecules are not going to go through on their own, even though they're small. Instead, we need to provide a hydrophilic passage, and the way that we can do this is through a transmembrane channel. Often, we wouldn't want that channel to just be open all the time because then what's going to happen? Although you start out with a gradient that's driving the flow of the ions in one direction, so you would have the flow of what, um, the ions 
um, along their gradient. So either into the cell or out of the cell. Remember that as you do that, basically you're normalizing the levels, you're evening things out. And so although you start with that gradient, you quickly lose that gradient. And so instead what's gonna happen is often we're kind of keeping those channels close. We're getting things all kind of lined up at the door. Um, it's like the grand opening and everyone's lined up at the door, ready to come in. But you don't until you get the signal that it's time, you open the door and let them all rush in. And so that's what we can do with these ion gated channels, which can be either gated by a ligand binding. So a ligand binds to the outside, opens that channel up, or they can be get, um, voltage gated. So basically you have a change in voltage. A change in voltage is going to then affect the shape of the protein due to charged groups on the protein either being attracted or repelled by the chain by that charge and therefore opening the gate, letting things through. So those would be examples of our gated ion channels. And by having these um, changes in the ion concentration, that can then lead to changes in the cell. Another thing is going to be our nuclear receptors for steroid hormones. So remember, steroids are going to be oxidized derivatives of sterols. And sterols were those things with those four rings, and then we had this long alkyl side chain. Our classic one was cholesterol, which was going to be in our membrane and serve as a kind of a fluidity buffer. It was able to be really good for our membrane because it had that hydrophobic character. It had that one little polar head group that allowed it to kind of stick out of the membrane and hang out with all of those hydrophilic heads of our phospholipids. But it also had this hydrophobic part that was then able to embed itself inside the membrane. With the, with the steroid, basically here you have some more oxidation, so you're a little more water soluble, but you also have this still greatly, mostly hydrophobic character that's going to allow it to freely diffuse into the cell. Once it diffuses into the cell, basically what can happen is it can go all the way into the nucleus because it can just diffuse into those through those membranes as well. Once in there, it can kind of bind um, to different like receptors in the nucleus. And these receptors in the nucleus um, these are going to basically bind to these regions on the DNA called these hormone response elements or HREs. These are regions next to kind of genes in the DNA that are going to I, like um, help recruit transcription factors that can either increase the transcription or decrease the transcription of genes, leading to changes in the amounts of various proteins that are going to be made. So in the case of our steroids, we're kind of just going straight into the nucleus and affecting things. But in the case of our GPCRs and our RTKs, well, here our signal can't get inside. So we had ions flowing in with our gated ion channel. Even so that we could have ligand gated ion channels. In that case, the ligand stays outside, but the ions come in. Um, in the case of our steroids, the signal was actually going all the way in. But in the case of our GPCRs and our RTKs, here, our signal, our ligand is going to stay all the way on the outside, and we need to relay that message into the inside. And so how we're going to do this is going to vary based on the type of receptors. In both of these cases, however, we, can, we often are dealing with primary and secondary messengers. So remember, the primary messenger, that's going to be the thing, the hormone that's going to bind to the outside of this protein and convey the message inside. The message will then be conveyed through a series of different proteins, um, as well as often by the production of a second small molecule that we'll call the second messenger. But let's start with kind of how this receptor is going to be um, functioning. So if we want a receptor that's going to be able to respond to signals on the outside and transmit those signals onto the inside, well, we're gonna need a protein that's gonna actually go through that membrane. Remember that we call these proteins integral membrane proteins, the proteins that actually go through the membrane, as opposed to peripheral membrane proteins, which are just hanging out on one side or the other. We will see that there are going to be a lot of peripheral proteins involved in helping kind of hold things together um, and pass that signal on, but the actual receptor protein is going to have to go all the way through. We've called the outside portion the ectodomain and the inside portion the endodomain. Then going through the membrane, we have the transmembrane domain. 
In that transmembrane domain, at least on the outside, you're going to have to have hydrophobic residues. And on the endo and ecto domains, you're going to have hydrophilic residues. That ecto domain is where basically you're going to have to bind to the ligand, or at least have a channel to some place in the transmembrane where you're going to bind to the ligand. This binding of the ligand is then going to cause a conformational change, a change in the shape of the receptor protein that's going to transmit the signal into the inside. In the case of our GPCRs, so our G protein coupled receptors, our membrane proteins are going to basically be these seven transmembrane proteins. Sometimes you'll see these called like heptahelical, so seven helixes because they have these seven alpha helices that move through the membrane. We'll see that there are a lot of different types of GPCRs, but they all have this really core cool conserved structure with these seven transmembrane domains. And if you look at a hydropathy plot of one of these, remember that on a hydropathy plot, the hydrophobic regions are above the line because basically it's saying that it would be energetically unfavorable to move those amino acids from a hydrophobic environment to a hydrophilic one. This is showing you a hydropathy index for rhodopsin, which is one of these GPCRs. And you can see that basically it takes about 20 amino acids per alpha helical pass. And so there are about seven alpha helices, um, or seven peaks here, which represent the seven alpha helices that are going through the membrane. So that's the actual receptor part. And it looks a bit like this, this like um, pink part here. But what about the G protein? Because it is a G protein coupled receptor. So G, what's a G protein? Well, a G protein is a small protein that can act as a kind of like self-limiting switch. What's it going to do? It's going to switch between these active form in which it's bound to GTP, so guanosine triphosphate, and an inactive form um, that's bound to GDP, so guanosine diphosphate. So just like ATP, um, but with, with guanosine instead of with the adenosine. And so basically what we're going to have here is just like with ATP, how the higher energy form is the ATP, and then you can like hydrolyze that to get ADP. Well, with GTP, the higher energy form is going to be the GTP, and you can hydrolyze that to get GDP. And how are you going to hydrolyze it? Um, well, with a hydrolase enzyme. And it turns out that these G proteins are actually G, um, hydrolase enzymes. They're GTPases. So basically, they can cleave off that end phosphate group. And so they can inactivate themselves. But it turns out that they can't activate themselves. So although they're able to break GTP, they can't make GTP. And so we're going to have regulatory proteins that are going to help exchange that spent GDP for a new GTP. What do we mean by like when it's active? Well, when it's active, what it's going to do is it's going to go and it's going to interact with other molecules and activate or inactivate them. The classic example we'll look with at is with this G protein going and activating a molecule called the denylyl cyclase, which is going to produce one of those secondary messengers we talked about. More specifically, a denylyl cyclase is going to produce cyclic A and P that can then go and signal um, through a variety of pathways, including by activating this protein kinase PKA, which is then going to go on and regulate other proteins. In terms of this G protein itself, remember how I said that it can kind of be in that GTP bound active form or in that GDP bound inactive form. And I said that the G protein itself could actually mediate that change. It could cut off that N phosphate, that gamma phosphate, go from GTP to GDP. Well, you wouldn't want it always doing that, right? Because then you'd be just turning your signal off all the time. But you do want it you do want it to happen eventually or else your signal would be on all the time. You don't want to always be making umbrellas if the rain stopped a long time ago. So we do want a way to regulate the activity of this protein and specifically we need to regulate both how quickly it breaks that GTP um, into GDP and then how easily it can kind of like release that GDP and exchange it for a new D GTP. And it turns out that there are regulatory proteins that can help with this.
There are proteins called GEFs or GTP GDT exchange factors, which are going to help turn them on, to help turn these G proteins on by turning, um, by allowing them to release the GDP and exchange it for GTP. So we'll see that in the case of the beta adrenergic receptor, what we actually have here is that this G protein coupled receptor is itself going to be acting as one of those guanosine exchange factors. The way it's going to be activating this G protein is by getting that G protein to dump its GDP and grab a GTP. We'll also see, however, that there are going to be proteins that are actually going to help turn the, GT, the G protein off. Remember, to turn a G protein off, you want to convert that GTP to GDP. And G, the G protein itself has the ability to do that, but it kind of is a very, has a very weak ability to do that because it doesn't kind of just turn itself off very easily, or else you would have a switch that would kind of just turn on and off really, really quick, which wouldn't be good. So instead, by having it kind of have a really slow intrinsic rate, you can then have it be controlled, but not have it, um, you can then have better level of control over it. And the way that we can help regulate it is through these gaps, these GTPase activator proteins. These are going to basically stimulate that GTPase activity, get that GTP um, to be hydrolyzed into GDP, and get your inactive G protein. So G proteins, when they're bound to GTP, they're active. When they um, break down the GDP, they're inactive. In order to break down the GTP, um, basically they often need to be stimulated, which can be done with these gaps. On the other hand, basically, if you want to then release that GDP and grab onto a GTP, well, here you often need help in the exchange of a GEF, a GTP GDP exchange factor. And that, for example, an example of that is going to be our beta adrenergic receptor. What we can see here is that basically, in the context of our beta adrenergic receptor, what we have is something that looks a lot different than what we were looking at before. In fact, we have these three subunits that are different. So we have a heterotrimeric complex. This G alpha subunit, this is going to be the one that's actually going to bind to our GDP or our GTP. But then we also have these two other subunits, these beta and these gamma subunits. We'll see that they're going to have regulatory functions. But the key thing here is that it's only that one subunit, that G alpha, that's going to actually bind to the GTP or to the GDP. When you're bound to the GTP, basically you form these interactions. Um, you can form these hydrogen bonding interactions with that N-phosphate group. Now it's able to interact with other protein partners, including that adenylylcyclase. And we'll see that when it interacts with that adenyl cyclase, well, now it's able to do things like activate that PKA and activate signaling pathways. But all of it is coming down to controlling the activity of this one little G protein. And just a quick note before we go into more details about the beta adrenergic receptor is that G proteins are basically, although we talk about them a lot in the context of these GPCRs, we can also find G proteins in other places in biochemistry, such as in the process of translation or the making of proteins. We have a variety of G proteins that are actually going to be helping kind of move things along in the ribosome by acting as exchange factors. And more on that in my posts on um, translation. But let's get back to our story about, about our G-protein coupled receptors. And so remember the basic idea with a G-protein coupled receptor, you have a ligand bind to this receptor, which in the receptor is going to act as one of those guanosine exchange factors. That is, it's going to promote the exchange of GDP for GTP, causing the receptor to change shape and therefore influencing what it's going to be able to react, to interact with. One of the things it's going to interact with is going to be adenylylcyclase. That adenylylcyclase is then going to interactivate PKA, which is then going to produce um, a variety of cellular responses. And we'll get much more into some of these responses and how we can kind of get these signaling pathways. But let's start back at the top and think about what our primary messenger is.
So remember that our primary messenger is going to be the thing that binds to the outside and um, that small molecule, that hormone that's going, some um, transmitter that's going to basically bind on the outside to the membrane receptor. The receptor is then going to change shape, affect what happens on the inside, and potentially produce a sec um, lead to the production of a secondary messenger, which is a small molecule inside the cell. Our primary receptor, our primary messenger in the case of our beta adrenergic receptors, is going to be um, adrenaline or noradrenaline. Um, so basically, just a couple of notes about the, any confusion. Adrenaline is also known as epinephrine, and noradrenaline is known as norepinephrine. Adrenaline is different from noradrenaline, um, but adrenaline is the same as epinephrine. So it's basically this whole confusing story where basically adrenaline means adrenal on top of the kidneys, and um, epinephrine means on, epi on top of the nephrine, the kidneys. And so basically, both of these are referring to being made in the adrenal gland, which is the gland that sits on top of your kidneys. Now, they just basically different names that because they come from different languages and were named by different scientists. So um, the scientists that found it, um, basically, apparently they didn't know it was the same thing as someone else found or something like this. Bottom line, the we typically call it the we typically call it um epinephrine in the US and like adrenaline elsewhere. I don't know. You can use either term, but it does the same thing. But noradrenaline and adrenaline are slightly different things. Noradrenaline adrenaline has this extra methyl group, noradrenaline doesn't. They go through a lot of the same receptors, um, but they can have slightly different functions. Speaking of different functions, the actually the end results of these of these molecules of the adrenaline or of the noradrenaline, that is your epinephrine or your norepinephrine, what they're going to do um, is going to depend on what types of cells you're dealing with and what types of receptors that you're dealing with. If you think about adrenaline, what, you, what do you probably think of? Well, you think of that like flight or fight response, right? And so if you think about that fight or flight response, if you see a bear, there's a lot of things that you're going to have to want to do to kind of like activate yourself to go and fight that bear or run away from that bear. You're going to want to do things like break down glycogen, free up some glucose that you can um, to kind of like have some energy. You might want to um, raise your blood pressure in regions, in some regions, so that you basically have more blood, uh, more blood flow in the parts that really need it, like your heart. But maybe you don't need as much blood flow in your fingertips, so you wanna constrict those. And so you wanna tighten those blood vessels. So basically, you're going to want different cells to be able to respond to different ways. And there are actually a variety of ways in which cells can respond differently to the same signal, even in the GPCR family. So there are actually a variety of different adrenergic receptors or these receptors that are going to bind to adrenaline and noradrenaline. We have basically these alpha receptor family and the beta receptor family, not to be confused with the alpha subunit of those G proteins. Basically, remember how I said that we had the G protein, the alpha subunit was what's going to bind to the, to the GTP? Well, it turns out it's a little more complicated because there are actually different versions of this alpha subunit. So the beta adrenergic receptor we're going to talk about, it deals with this GS, sub, this GS alpha and this GS beta and this GS gamma. And that S stands for stimulatory because it's going to go and it's going to stimulate or activate adenylate cyclase, increasing the production of cyclic AMP. And there are several different beta subunits, um, beta families of receptors that are able to do this. Now there's also the alpha subunit. Uh, the alpha receptors. And so here, basically, you have these GQ proteins or these GI proteins or GO proteins. Um, basically, we'll look at how the GQ-coupled ones, instead of acting through adenylate cyclase, they act through a different pathway involving IP3 and calcium um, that are produced by them activating phospholipase C. And so we'll look at this pathway. But first, we're going to look at this GS-coupled pathway. And finally, if we said that GS was simulatory, GI is inhibitory. This pathway is going to decrease cyclic AMP by inhibiting adenylate cyclase. Well, we'll see, um, 
we're not really going to look into detail about this, but basically noradrenaline often acts, has a higher affinity for these alpha than the beta. And so it's going to have um, more kind of just regulatory functions as opposed to adrenaline, which typically has more of that um, acute fight or spite response. But I'm not going to go too much into the whole like hormone, neuro, all that stuff, because that's just really not my specialty. But hopefully this will help you understand sort of the biochemistry behind what's going on. If you can follow the basics of these pathways, then you can be then you can look up the look up the different receptors, look up the various pathways, and kind of predict what might be going on in different places. So let's talk about this beta adrenergic receptor, which is kind of like a prototypical GPCR. We have this GS protein. So basically, we have one of the stimulatory proteins. So it's going to go and it's going to stimulate our adenylocyclase. And adenylocyclase, what it's going to do is it's going to produce cyclic AMP. Now, cyclic AMP is basically the cyclized version of adenosine monophosphate. So what adenylocyclase is, is it's an enzyme that it's going to take this ATP and it's going to kind of get it to attack itself. So it's going to cause the cyclization by promoting um, the attack of this hydroxyl oxygen onto this phosphate group. This is then going onto this phosphate group. This is then going to lead to the cyclization and the kicking off of, of the pyrophosphate, so that PPI. Ultimately, what this is going to happen is that you're then going to get this cyclized molecule, cyclic AMP, that's then able to go and act as a second messenger. So remember, our primary messenger was going to be the hormone on the outside that's going to be kind of um, kicking things off, but not getting into the cells. Our secondary mes second messenger is going to be a small molecule inside of the cell that's then able to kind of relay the signal on. As opposed to like one of the protein factors, like it's adenylocyclase, this second messenger is going to be a small molecule that can actually move throughout the cell, and therefore it can kind of like amplify the signal and go on to activate a lot of molecules. In the case of our, um, in the case of our this pathway, what we're going to do is we're going to see that it's going to activate this protein kinase A or PKA. So cyclic AMP is an allosteric activator of protein kinase A. So it's allosteric, meaning that basically it binds one place and it changes what happens in another place. So it doesn't bind to the place at which the, like the substrate binds or the ATP binds or anything like this. It binds to a different site. It binds to a site that's going to cause that protein to change shape and release these regulatory domains, um, but these regulatory proteins from the catalytic subunit. So basically PKA is this multi-subunit protein and it has these regulatory subunits and these catalytic subunits. The catalytic subunit is going to be the place that's actually going to bind to the substrate that the protein that it's going to phosphorylate. Um, and by phosphorylating, it can change, it can either activate or inactivate that protein, but it can only do that if this catalytic subunit isn't kind of blocked by the regulatory subunit. What happens when cyclic AMP binds is that it's going to free up that regular that free the catalytic subunit from the regulatory subunit. This is going to expose the substrate binding cleft so that this this catalytic subunit can now bind to the protein targets and cause them to get um and then phosphorylate them. How um so this basically what's going to happen is we started off with that tri. We started off with this heterotrimer. When we had the GTP bind to the, the alpha subunit, basically we had to get that alpha subunit to the adenylocyclase. The adenylocyclase was embedded in the membrane, but basically we still have to get it there. Thankfully, this G um, subunit alpha, this alpha um, subunit, it has this, this lipidy tail that can kind of go and it can kind of insert itself in the membrane. And so what it's going to do is it's kind of like anchored in the membrane. But remember how we said that the that like lipids could and proteins and stuff could diffuse laterally. They just needed help if they wanted to actually like go to the other side of the membrane. So if they wanted to flip or flop, then they need help. But if they just want to travel laterally, they're able to do this as long as there's not like other proteins like blocking their path or something. So what we can get is when this GT, when the GD, when the um, recept, when the ligand binds to the receptor, so our primary messenger binds to the receptor, 
causes a um, conformational change that causes the the GT the G the GS alpha subunit to basically exchange that DDP for GTP. When it's bound to the GTP form, it's activated. And in this active form, it decides it doesn't like these beta and gamma subunits, and so it ditches them. It then diffuses and finds adenyl cyclase. It now has a higher affinity for adenyl cyclase. Now that we basically act, we've um, changed the shape of that G protein, and we've exposed this region, the signaling helix that's going to go and bind to adenyl cyclase. So when you're bound to a GDP, you don't have the like binding interaction sites exposed. You bind to GD, GTP, you lose affinity for those, um, those beta and gamma subunits, but you gain affinity for adenyl cyclase. So you're gonna ditch those beta and gamma subunits and go and find that adenyl cyclase, which is sitting there in the membrane. And we said adenyl cyclase is going to produce that cyclic AMP, and now that cyclic AMP is going to go and it's going to activate PKA. How is it going to find it? We don't want it basically that cyclic AMP just like floating all over the cells and kind of just have a high concentration everywhere. That'd be super hard to clean up your mess, right? It'd be hard to turn it off. And it could even if it didn't have enough though, it would take a while to actually go and find that PKA. So instead, your cells are smart. They kind of scaffold things together using adapter proteins. So adapter proteins are non-catalytic proteins, so they're not enzymes or anything, but they kind of have a lot of binding sites that are able to kind of hold things together. And you have this PKA protein itself is not going to be attached into the membrane, but it can be attached to scaffolding proteins that are. Commonly, what we have are these ACAPs, or these A kinase anchoring proteins. These have multiple distinct protein binding domains that can do things like bind to PKA and bind to adenyl cyclase and the receptor, hold all of these together in the same place so that it's not as far of a travel to have to go. You can also have it hold on to regulatory proteins like phosphatases that are then able to reverse the action of PKA. So all of these can kind of be held together and help things interact. You can also imagine that by scaffolding different proteins together, you could then affect different pathways. As to what happens next, well, if you think about it, if you see a bear, one of the things that you're going to want to do is you're going to want to break down your glycogen. You're going to want to release glucose so that you have energy to go and run away. And one of the, there's a lot of regulation that goes into that, but ultimately you're going to have this enzyme um, glycogen phosphorylase A that's going to actually break down glycogen to release glucose 1-phosphate, which can then be transformed um, into glucose. So this is our main blood sugar. And so we'll talk more about how we can actually break down glycogen, how we can make glycogen. But for now, know that there's this protein glycogen phosphorylase A that will break down glycogen to give you glucose. But there's a lot of regulation that goes into it. In fact, this glycogen phosphorylase A is basically regulated by a molecule called glycogen phosphorylase B, which is regulated by a molecule called phosphorylase B, um, phosphorylase B kinase, which is regulated by PKA. And so lots and lots of levels of regulation. But when you look at one of these pathways of like a signaling pathway, all you need to do is look at where things are green and where things are red. So in this case, it's showing us where things are green. So it's basically saying that this is going to stimulate this, and this is going to stimulate this, and this is going to stimulate this, and this is going to stimulate this. So as long as you have things drawn out, you can kind of see the logic of the pathways and think about what might happen if you had changes at any of these levels. But first, let's think about what happens if we go and we activate things. So say we start with one molecule of epinephrine, so our adrenaline. It's going to bind to that G protein coupled receptor. If we're imagining it's binding to that beta adrenergic receptor, remember we're going to have that G, that, G, that tri heterotrimeric G protein. Our G subunit alpha is going to be the one that's actually going to be in its inactive form bound to GDP. It's going to, upon the binding of the adrenaline to the receptor, the receptor is going to do its thing. It's going to act as one of those guanosine exchange factors, um, cause the release of GDP, 
the binding of GTP, which is going to change the shape of the GT, um, the G subunit alpha, cause it to ditch the beta and gamma and move over and activate adenylocyclase. Adenylocyclase, remember, is going to then catalyze the trans, um, the change of ATP to cyclic AMP or CAMP, which is our second messenger. When we had on the outside, we basically, we had one molecule, one complex. Once that G protein moved, the alpha subunit moved away, we're left with this beta and gamma subunit, which we'll talk about later how they can play important regulatory functions too. But this receptor, it still has that adrenaline or noradrenaline bound. Um, it's still act in its active state, but it doesn't have anything to activate. But there are other G subunit alphas floating around there. And so this can actually engage with another G protein. And so basically what happens is the single receptor can activate multiple molecules. It can activate multiple G proteins. So in this example, they're just putting some numbers on things, but it might be different than this. Um, but basically they say, okay, well, you have one of these receptor complexes. Maybe you generate like 10 active G subunit alphas. And now each of those can go and they can, gen um, they can activate adenylocyclase. And when they activate adenylocyclase, well, they're going to keep activating adenylocyclase until they're turned off. And so remember, they have that intrinsic um, GTPase activity. So eventually, they're going to break down the GTP to GDP, but that's going to be slow unless we have those, um, those gaps, those, the GTPase activating proteins, which are basically going to cause it to break down that GTP faster. But until then, basically what you're going to have is you're going to have this G protein that's going to be stimulating this adenylocyclase. And adenylocyclase, well, it's an enzyme, so it keeps doing things over and over, as long as there's enough substrate. And there's plenty of ATP in our cells. In fact, we'll look at how basically we have to keep ATP levels really, really high in order to make it energetically useful. So that ATP, that abundant ATP, is going to be transformed into cyclic AMP or CAMP, which is our second dip messenger. So if you imagine that now you go and you make about 200 molecules of that. Well, now that cyclic AMP, remember that it was bringing the message to, in this case, PKA or protein kinase A. It could bind to and allosterically activate PKA, causing, P, uh, um, causing PKA to activate other proteins. So you can go from um, to like about 100 molecules of active PKA because you have to have multiple cyclic A and P um, in order to activate a single PKA. But then once activated that PKA, it's a kinase, it has phosphate groups, and it can keep, it's an enzyme, it can keep doing this over and over as long as there's enough substrate. And what's its substrate? ATP. And we just said that we had lots of ATP. So basically this active PKA can now go and it can phosphorylate all sorts of stuff. It can go and it can do things like activate phosphorylase B kinase. And why is this important? Well, phosphorylase B kinase, it's another kinase. So it's one of those molecules that can go phosphorylate and regulate other molecules. And when it's active, it can go phosphorylate and regulate glycogen phosphorylase B. And when glycogen phosphorylase B is active, it activates glycogen phosphorylase A. And when glycogen phosphorylase A is active, well, now it's going to break down our glycogen into our glucose 1-phosphate. And by having these kinases, each of which can kind of go and phosphorylate a lot of different molecules, we quickly went from 100 pKa to 1,000 um, phosphorylase B kinases to 10,000 glycogen phosphorylase A to 100,000 molecules of our glucose 1-phosphate and ultimately 100,000 molecules of glucose into our blood, all from that one epinephrine molecule. And again, this is just some like sample numbers, um, but things might be different. But you can quickly get this signal amplification where one molecule, one primary message can lead to this large amount of ultimate result. You can also imagine that, well, if things weren't controlled very well, this could quickly get out of hand. And in fact, we'll talk about how mutations in these signaling pathways are a common reason for or associated with cancer, which is uncontrolled cell death. Because a lot of these signaling pathways are important for providing signals to do things like grow, divide, and thrive. Not all signals are going to be stimulatory though. Ligands can broadly be classified as agonists and antagonists. So agonists are going to bind to receptors and activate them. 
So the adrenaline was binding to our receptor and it was activating that beta adrenergic receptor. There are also molecules that are called antagonists, which are going to bind to receptors and prevent their activation. These can be natural or they can be unnatural. And often what we'll hear about is like pharmaceutical drugs being at, made to be antagonists. So basically they bind to receptors and cause them to, to not be activated or to somehow change. And basically what we're going to see is that these are also going to be great tools in the lab for kind of figuring out what's going on. You probably experiment with um, with the antagonist yourself all the time um, when you're drinking caffeine. Caffeine acts as an antagonist of adenosine receptors. So basically, those are a different type of receptor, but they bind to these adenosine receptors. But instead of activating them, like would happen with adenosine when going on to make you drowsy and stuff, they inactivate them and prevent you from, prevent those receptors from activating and therefore you don't get as drowsy and stuff. And of course there are other ways that caffeine acts as well because nothing is ever simple in biochemistry. And we'll actually talk about how one of, um, well, I'll actually mention quickly, basically caffeine is also an inhibitor of this phosphodiesterase whose job is to break down that cyclic AMP um, to AMP. So you can kind of get rid of that second messenger. You can imagine that if you inhibit that phosphodiesterase, you're inhibiting the breakdown of your second messenger. And so now basically what's going to happen is you're going to keep having the cyclic AMP, keep activating the pathway and keep you awake. There's so as I mentioned, there are a lot of like pharmaceutical drugs that act as antagonists. Um, so here are a couple of examples. Um, so like propranol, propanolol is an antagonist. Um, isoprotonol is an agonist of epinephrine. Um, and so why don't you like go and take a minute and think about what might happen if you had the presence of one of these agonists or antagonists? What would happen in terms of the amount of glucose you might release? Or what would happen in terms of the amount of PKA of um, cyclic AMP? If we had an agonist like isoproteranol, what would happen is we'd increase the amount of glucose that was released at the end of this pathway. We'd increase the amount of cyclic AMP. But in the case of an antagonist, well, here we'd have the opposite. It would bind and prevent the activation. We would have less of the cyclic AMP made and ultimately less of our blood glucose released. And blood glucose release is only one of the things that was actually that these receptors were doing, remember? So you can imagine that we could have effects on, say, blood pressure. Isoproteinol, um, so basically our agonist, well, you'd imagine it could do things like raise your blood pressure. So if you have a heart problem, maybe you take that in order to kind of like keep your blood pressure regulated. Or maybe when you're under anesthesia and you need to kind of like make sure the patient keeps breathing. Those are both places in which you see isoproteinol used. As to propranolol, basically this is going to be um, kind of do the reverse. So it can, if you have high blood pressure, this can lower the blood pressure um, and do things like this. It's also used to treat migraines and things. Um, so various roles of antagonists as well as agonists. And you can see too that in the case of this isoproteranol, it has a KD of 0.4 as opposed to epinephrine's KD of 5 micromolar. This means that it's a tighter binder, and so even for the same amount of this agonist as you had with epinephrine, you'd actually get a, more, a stronger, more prolonged response. Because one of the ways in which this pathway can kind of like be turned off is if you don't have any epinephrine around, if that signal goes away. Eventually, it's going to stop raining, and so you're eventually going to stop being told that you need to bring an umbrella. But you have this whole pathway down below where they're still signaling. So even though the signal might stop at the top, you're still going to have this all of these molecules to deal with. Um, and so the stronger the affinity of this initial signaling molecule, the less of it that you'll need in order to keep the signaling active from the top. Um, but no matter what, you're still going to have to deal with we'll deal with all that mess that you made already. And often what they're going to be is in cancer, there are going to be mutations in those signaling units. You can imagine that problems throughout, through various parts of this pathway could all lead to trouble. But if you have a problem up at the top, well, here you're going to have the most mess, um, the most mess to deal with if you're not turning off, if you're like constantly having that fire hose keep going.
So we'll see that actually mutations in that G alpha, so that G protein, that kind of like activate them, uh, those are going to lead to a continuously elevated cyclic AMP, and these are common in cancer. About 40% of adenomas have activating mutations in that G alpha. There are also inactivating mutations that cause individuals to be unresponsive to hormones that act through cyclic AMP. Even in the absence of any mutations, we still need a way to basically turn off this signaling. And so how might we do that? Kind of how we mentioned before, if we want to kind of have the most dramatic response, we're going to want to go to the start of the pathway. If we wanted, when we talked about whether we, how we could kind of affect the making of proteins or affect what was going on, the ultimate product, if we wanted to do that, well, now we wanted to act the level of transcription. If we want to affect how much of a final protein is being made, we want to cut off the cut things off the source. In that case, our source was transcription, because if we stop the DNA from being transcribed to RNA, messenger RNA, we stop there being messenger RNA to be made into protein. We could go and we can modulate the proteins, do things like phosphorylate them, regulate their activity, and that would act faster, but it wouldn't be very efficient because we keep having to modify those proteins that we made. Similarly, we could stop signaling by kind of removing those end products of the pathway. We could do things like inactivate our PKA or inactivate our glycogen phosphorylase A. We can take away that cyclic AMP. But unless we actually remove that receptor or turn off the receptor, we're going to keep generating those things that we're going to have to keep, um, keep dealing with. So one of the main ways we can do this is by actually like desensitization or basically kind of getting the receptor to stop responding to the signal. And one way that we can do this is by like removing the receptor from the plasma membrane. So um, let's go back to that poor old beta and gamma who don't get very much attention those other subunits of our stimulatory pathway. So remember that the G-alpha ditched them once it got this, um, once it got GTP. So it got GTP, it decided it doesn't like beta and gamma, but it does like adenyl cyclase. So those beta and gamma subunits are going to be stuck, um, stay here. And now what they're going to do, though, is they're going to decide that they have other friends. So they're going to recruit this protein called, um, called beta ARK to the membrane. And this, the K here is going to be kinase. It's um, basically, it's going to phosphorylate the adenosine receptor um, at these serine residues in its carboxyl terminus. So basically in part of this receptor that's sticking out into the cytoplasm, it's going to phosphorylate them. And it's going to be recruited by the beta and gamma subunits, which remember before they were tied up with that G alpha subunit, which didn't even like them that much. But now basically down the free, they can interact with this beta ARK which can itself phosphorylate this receptor. When the receptor is phosphorylated, well, this activate this makes binding sites for another protein, beta-arrestin. Beta-arrestin is going to bind to that phosphorylated receptor, and this is going to cause this, um, cause this response that's going to lead to the pinching in of the membrane around it to lead to the internalization of the receptor membrane um, complex. Um, and so basically what's going to happen is this is going to be internalized through endocytosis. Once in that endocytic vesicle, these things are going to kind of dissociate. The receptor is going to get dephosphorylated, and now it can get returned to the cell surface um, when, when you want to have signaling again. So in this way, the, those beta and gamma subunits are able to, through beta-arrestin, help lead to the lead to the removal of the receptor from the cell surface. Not as efficient, but if we want, we can also remove that cyclic AMP signal um, because even if we were to remove that, that from things from the top, we would still have to deal with the cyclic AMP. Um, and maybe we don't even wanna remove things all the way from the top. We just wanna kind of control things a little. So over time, basically you have this enzyme cyclic nucleotide phosphodiesterase phosphodiesterase, it breaks a phosphodiester bond, such as this one. What it's going to do is it's going to break that cyclization, cyclized bond. Um, basically, it's going to give us back normal adenosine monophosphate, or AMP. And that AMP isn't going to act as a second messenger like C cyclic AMP did. So now your signal is stopped.
So ultimately, this is one of the main ways in which these beta adrenergic receptors are going to work is that they bind to this G protein linked receptor and activate it. The G protein is then going to activate adenylocyclase. Adenylocyclase is going to make cyclic AMP. So remember, cyclic AMP is going to be our second messenger. Cyclic AMP is going to bind and activate, allosterically activate protein kinase A. Protein kinase is a kinase. It's able to phosphorylate a bunch of stuff. So it goes and it phosphorylates a bunch of stuff. And it phosphorylates gene regulatory proteins as well as many other target proteins. Turns out, though, that um, there are not all of these G proteins are actually going to activate the um, adenylocyclase. So remember, we also had like our GIs, which are going to inactivate it. Um, and therefore, they would decrease the cyclic AMP. We also have these subunits GQ that instead of acting on adenylocyclase, they actually act through a different pathway. They act using a different second, second messengers, IP3 and calcium. They're going to do this by activating a different protein, phospholipase C. So phospholipase C is basically a lipase that's going to cut a lipid. What it's going to do is it's going to more specifically cut phosphatidyl inositol 4,5-bisphosphate or PIP2, cut it off, cut its kind of like head off so that you're left with diacylglycerol or DAG and inositol 1,4,5-triphosphate or IP3. So remember that in a phospholipid, we had this phospholipid head, or we had this phosphate-containing head group that was hydrophilic, and then this hydrophobic tails. If we cut that hydrophilic head off, well, now we have this soluble part, this IP3, this hydrophilic head is now kind of like free-floating, and we also have this part that's still embedded in the membrane, the lipidy part, the diacylglycerol. Now, both of these are going to serve important fun signaling functions. So we have a receptor, and this receptor, we still have a header of trimeric G protein, and it still has an alpha subunit, a beta subunit, and a gamma subunit. But in this case, our alpha subunit is going to be one of these Q subunits. I tried to find what the Q stand for, but no luck. So instead of trying to go down a bunch of rabbit holes, I'm going to just leave it as it's Q. This GQ subunit, what it does is it's going to activate phospholipase C, or PLC which is another one of those membrane embedded proteins. So just like we had adenylocyclase that the alpha subunit was traveling to, um, this S alpha subunit was traveling to, or the I1, um, with the phospholipid C, phospholipase C, here we have the Q subunit traveling through the membrane, thanks to its kind of like um, lipid attached tail, and therefore it's going to go and interact with phospholipase C. When it's in its active form, it's going to activate phospholipase C, Phospholipase C is going to cut the head off of the phospholipid. When it cuts that head off, remember you get those two parts, you get IP3 and you get DAG. Now, the, the DAG is stuck in the, in the membrane, but it can, it, can trend, it can move laterally. And so it can go and it can associate with a different protein, protein kinase C. So basically in its headless form, it likes to hang out with protein kinase C or PKC. Now, PKC is another protein kinase, so you can imagine that it's going to have a bunch of important regulatory roles by phosphorylating and changing the activity of a bunch of different proteins, but it's not enough for it to be bound by DAG. It also needs a second signal in order to actually get activated. It needs another second messenger. So we could call this, um, we could call this PIP2, and we could, or we can call this IP3 and the stag, these small molecules, we can call these second messengers, but um, we actually need a third second messenger in this pathway as well, um, which is going to be our calcium. So all of those are combined going to act as these little molecules that are going to help send the message throughout the cell. Protein kinase C, it kind of has this like dual secure two-factor two authentication. You don't want it turning off, um, turning on prematurely or anything. So we say, okay, well, it's not just enough to bind to DAG. We also want to bind, we have it bind to calcium. And how are we going to get calcium? Well, remember we talked about how in our cells we have those like circa pumps, which are going to use energy to pump calcium into our endoplasmic reticulum against its gradient so that we can maintain a high amount of calcium inside of this little compartment in our cells that if we then open up a channel, we can release it into the cytoplasm.
So we have one of those receptor gated channels that is going to be activated by the binding of IP3. When IP3 binds, we open up that channel, we let the calcium flow out. When the calcium flows out, now it can go and it can bind to protein kinase C. And so protein kinase C is now, it has those two factors it needs. It has the DAG and it has the calcium. And now what's going to happen is it's going to be activated. And then it can go and it can regulate a bunch of other proteins. So we've had the, um, the G alpha, the GQ alpha was going to activate. So the receptor activates GQ alpha. GQ alpha swaps GDP for GTP. Now activated, the GQ alpha is going to travel and go and find phospholipase C and activate it. Phospholipase C is going to chop the head off of PIP2 to produce DAG and IP3. DAG is going to stay in the membrane and it's going to go and it's going to travel and it's going to find protein kinase C. Protein kinase C has the power to do a lot of regulatory stuff, but in order to do all that regulatory stuff, it needs its two-factor authentication it needs both the DAG and the IP3, or and the calcium. How's it going to get the calcium? Well, the calcium is stored in these in the endoplasmic reticulum. So in order to get released, the calcium receptor has to bind to IP3. IP3 is going to bind to this receptor and open the channel. It's going to lead to the outflux of calcium. Um, now we're doing passive facilitated passive diffusion, passive diffusion out of the out from the endoplasmic reticulum into the cytoplasm where it can go and it can bind to protein kinase C and activate it. And then a lot of stuff happens. So basically, diacylglycerol and inositol triphosphate and calcium have related roles as secondary messengers. And there's a lot of different pathways that are going to actually act through them. So not only do we have that, um, we can we have adrenergic receptors that are going to respond, but we can also have a bunch of others, a bunch of other signaling pathways, angiogenin, oxytocin, vasopressin, serotonin, all sorts of different pathways that are going to act through this as a second messenger. But how is that calcium actually going to be able to activate things? So we saw how it can kind of like help activate, help activate our PKC, but it also activates a lot of other things. And so just how we can have cyclic A and P, not just to activate adenylocyclase, well, these second messengers can activate multiple other things as well. And the way that they do this is often through this to bind um, through this protein called commodulin. Now, commodulin has this shape that's going to change drastically in the presence of calcium. Commodulin has this shape that's kind of, it's this EF, this EF hand it's called. Um, and so you can kind of think about it they, it's this, you can think about like having your finger up and your thumb out. Um, here it's your first finger, but if you want to remember the F, you can think about your middle finger being up. Um, but basically it's just to represent this structure where you kind of have these, those domains are going to be curled around the calcium. And when the calcium isn't present, you're going to get this long helix. And then when the calcium binds, it kind of like bind, bends in half in a way. Bottom line, you change the shape drastically in the presence of calcium. When you change the shape of a protein, well, now you're going to change its binding interactions. And so this is going to modulate calmodulin's interactions with other proteins. There are a lot of proteins that are going to be regulated by calmodulin, including calmodulin-dependent um, protein kinases, or these CAM kinases, um, as well as all sorts of other proteins, including, look at this, cyclic A and P phosphodiesterase. So we can already see we have crosstalk between these different pathways, our cyclic A and P pathway, um, which was regulated by adenylocyclase, and our pathways that were regulated by phospholipase C and the, re the release of calcium. So basically, we have these two main paths that we can go from a G-protein-coupled receptor. We could go to have our G protein stimulate adenylocyclase, produce cyclic A and P, activate PKA, activate other stuff. We could also have our G protein receptor kind, of, our G protein recept coupled receptor, um, activate have a, a G protein which activates phospholipase C, which is then going to lead to the cleavage of the PIP2 into IP3 and DAG, which are then IP3 is going to go and it's going to cause the release of calcium. Calcium and diacylglycerol are going to together activate PKC, 
And not only do you act to have one calcium molecule though, because it's one of those secondary messengers, we're getting that like amplification, we're releasing a lot of calcium. And so not all of it is needed to go and activate PKC. Some of it can go and it can bind to calmodulin. Binding to calmodulin causes it to change shape and interact with other proteins, including our CAM kinase. This can then go and, active and regulate a bunch of other stuff. And that's just a start. There are lots of other GPRs that we don't have time to go into, but once you know the basic mechanism and logic, you can figure out what's going on in any of them. So remember that if you see one of these S's, this is going to be a stimulatory. It's going to stimulate adenyl cyclase. And the classic example of this was our beta adrenergic receptor, which is going to respond to epinephrine by increasing the production of cyclic AMP and activating PKA. We also saw how it could go we can have a GQ subunit that's going to go and it's going to activate the phospholipase C and lead to the release of calcium as well as IP3 um, and PIP2 and STAG. We also can have these inhibitory subunits like which vasopressin binds to one of these receptors. It has this inhibitory subunit which is going to inhibit adenylocyclase, lead to the less cyclic AMP being made and less PKA being activated. We also have receptors that are going to do things like bind to um, light and odor, or that are going to respond to light or bind to odorants or sweet tastants um, and cause signaling in different ways. So we see that our senses are intimately tied up with GPCRs. There are about like 800 different GPCRs and we don't even know what some of them do, um, but bottom line is they all kind of have the same logic and they can respond to all sorts of different types of hormones um, and signals. When it comes to hormones, we can talk about different classes of hormones. So we can have some that are like proteins, like little proteins, like gonadotropin, thyrotropin, follicle stimulating hormone, that like FSH. We can also have peptides. So just like short little pieces of proteins, um, things like angiotensin and bradykinin, neurotensin, somatostatin, vasopressin. We can have amines. So like these small sort of um, amino acid like pro like thingamabobs um, or just basically groups with amine groups, little molecules with amine groups. So we can have like acetylcholine, we can have our epinephrine, our histamine, our serotonin. We can have other things, um, opioids, rhodopsin, melatonin, all these various signals, which you can imagine that you would need a different receptor for each of these, but by then controlling what receptors different cells have, you can control what sorts of cells are able to respond to what signals. Like maybe you don't need all of your cells to respond to something um, like oxytocin or vasopressin or dopamine. Maybe your, your toes don't care that much about serotonin, but they care not, they care about other things. Um, and so the way that they care or don't care is because of what receptors they have and how many receptors they have and how things are scaffolded once the, to that receptor. And that was just our GPCRs. So now let's talk about our second main type of kind of these um, receptor proteins, um, signal transduction machines, thingamabobs are RTKs, or receptor tyrosine kinases. In the case of our G-protein coupled receptor, remember what our receptor was, it was that seven transmembrane protein that was going to not be an enzyme itself, um, and it, but it was attached to an enzyme. It was attached to that G-protein that could ultimately act as a GTPase and inactivate itself, act as that switch. And the role of the, the receptor was actually as one of those guanosine exchange factors to get that G protein to dump its GDP and form a um, and pick up a GTP, activate that and cause the signaling. In the case of our receptor tyrosine kinase, here our receptor is itself an enzyme. It's going to be a tyrosine kinase. When we talk about kinases, basically the name before the kinase, the amino acid before the kinase is telling you what it phosphorylates. And so it phosphorylates tyrosines. More specifically, these receptor tyrosine kinases, they can actually phosphorylate themselves. Um, and they can phosphorylate other things as well. But in order to be activated, they have to first phosphorylate themselves. And when something's phosphorylating itself, we call it autophosphorylation. So it actually phosphorylates like the other copy of itself. So these are going to act, in, receptor tyrosine kinases are going to act in like dimers, 
Um, and so sometimes we'll see that they're going to be constitutive dimers, such as in the case of our insulin receptor, our INSR, it's going to act as a constitutive dimer. So it's always a dimer, but it's not active. On the other hand, we have other sorts of receptor tyrosine kinases that are going to be monomeric. Um, and then only upon the binding of a ligand do they come together. So with our insulin receptor, basically here, the binding of a ligand activates it, um, but it doesn't um, cause the dimerization. It's already a dimer. But with these other ones, binding of a ligand causes the dimerization and then the activation. Once you have the activation of one of these, basically they autophosphorylate one another, then they start phosphorylating other proteins, leading to a kinase signaling cascade. How do you actually activate these? Um, basically what happens is in the case of the insulin receptor, you have this dimer. So remember it's this constitutive dimer, but it's going to have an inactive kinase domains. These tyrosine kinase domains, they're going to be capable of phosphorylating tyrosines, including tyrosines on, on themselves or on the other kind of like monomer, the other copy of itself. But they, can, they can't do this um, unless they kind of have the right confirmation. And they won't have the right confirmation unless you actually have the binding of the ligand. So the binding of the ligand causes a conformational change that's going to activate the subunits to activate one another. So basically, it changes the shape of these subunits so that they're then able to go and phosphorylate one another. Once they phosphorylate one another, they basically phosphorylate this key part called the activation loop. This activation loop was blocking the, the substrate binding site. So the part where kind of like the active site where the thing the substrate needs to bind to get phosphorylated, you have this activation loop that's blocking it. If you phosphorylate the activation loop, well, now you move that loop out of the way and allow substrate to bind. So these sub, these, um, these dimers, these monomers can basically phosphorylate one another's activation loops to move those loops out of the way and now active, um, cause this substrate binding site to be open so that they can phosphorylate things. We'll see that it can then go and it can phosphorylate um, this protein called IRS1. Now, IRS1 um, is basically then going to do, what it's going to do is it's going to, once it's phosphorylated, it's going to serve as sort of this, this kind of connection point. So IRS1 stands for insulin receptor substrate, substrate one. And what it does is it's kind of just this hub. So it has these sites that get phosphorylated by the insulin receptor, but only remember if the insulin receptor is activated. So if the insulin receptor binds to insulin, it activates itself, which is then going to go and phosphorylate IRS1. Once IRS1 is phosphorylated, well, now it's going to have a binding site for a protein called GRB2. Um, and GRB2 is basically then going to bind to this protein called SOS. SOS is then going to bind to this protein called RAS. And what's, what, what's RAS? Well, RAS is one of our G proteins. And so RAS is one of those little G proteins that's basically, this one's monomeric, but it's able to do just what all G proteins do. It's able to take GTP um, and break it down. And it's able to then exchange that GDP, um, the broken down GT, the, the end product of that breakdown, the GDP, it can dump that and bind to GTP. But remember, that's going to be a slow process. And so we can have proteins that are going to speed things up. And one of the proteins that could speed things up is going to be this SOS protein. This SOS protein is then therefore going to act as one of those guanosine exchange factors. It's going to help RAS switch out the GDP for the GTP and activate RAS. The activated RAS, well, it is going to bind and activate RAF1. Now RAF is going to be a kinase and it's going to set off a signaling cascade of kinases. So when we have a kinase and we have, so we have one kinase and it can phosphorylate a lot of stuff. What if we have a kinase phosphorylated kinase? Well, now we can have that one kinase phosphorylate another, a lot of other kinases, which can phosphorylate another, a lot of other kinases, which can phosphorylate another kinases, which can phosphorylate a lot of other kinases. And so in this way, we're going to get a big signal amplification, even without the production of any really like secondary messenger 
Um, but we can have this phosphorylation cascade where ultimately we can phosphorylate a protein that can then go into the nucleus and affect the transcription of genes. Um, and so this is one of the common pathways that we'll see is this like MEC pathway. So we had ultimately this protein ERK that was the one that was actually getting into the nucleus. And it turns out that ERK, as well as MEC, so the thing that activated ERK, as well as RAF, which was the thing that activated MEC, these are all basically in larger families. And these families have kind of ridiculous names. Um, so ERK is in the MAPK family for myogen activated protein kinases. And it's specific for serotonin residues. Um, so it's not a tyrosine kinase. It, um, instead of phosphorylating tyrosines, it phosphorylates serotonin residues. Um, and not just any ones, it has like all kinases. They have like consensus sequences, which are the things that they like to phosphorylate. So they're not just phosphorylating anything. But it phosphorylates specific serotonin residues. Um, and it can phosphorylate things like transcription factors. Um, such as ELK1, which is then going to activate them and, and cause differences in the transcription of different genes. Um, and often for like insulin, you'd have things that were needed for cell division. Um, but ERK was activated by, um, so if we had ERK be in this MAPK family, well, it was activated by MEC. And MEC is in the MAP kinase kinase family. Um, so basically, it's a kinase that activates the MAP kinase. Um, and so MEC is going to be in the MAP KK family. And then if we had a MAP kinase kinase that was activated by another kinase, well, that other kinase would be a MAP kinase kinase kinase. So RAF1 is in the MAP kinase 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 or MAP KKK family. Um, and so basically, yeah, the, the naming can get complicated. Um, but basically, what I find is the most useful is just kind of being able to look at pathways and look at arrows, what's going where, and not try to memorize everything. Speaking of what's going where, how do things know like where to go? Well, basically, if you imagine how many different proteins are in a cell, you're going to need a way to kind of hold things together. And one of the ways that you'll do this is with these scaffolding proteins. So this is one example, this kinase suppressor of RAS. Uh, basically, this is a scaffolding protein that's kind of going to hold together all those components of the pathway so that things can, can find each other more easily. How do these things all kind of like bind together? A lot of it is going to be mediated by these, um, by binding to phosphorylation sites. So there are a couple of main kind of like phosphate binding domains. So one is this SH2 domain, which is a protein domain that binds to phosphorylated tyrosine residues. We also have SH3 and pH domains, which are protein domains that bind the membrane phospholipid PIP3. So we have phosphorylation mediated ways in which we could kind of bind to membranes and which we could bind to phosphorylated proteins. And what you see a lot is that basically different types of proteins are going to have different combinations of these SH2 and SH3 domains, as well as a lot of other domains. Um, and so by kind of like having all of these different domains and all of these sites, you're then able to um, build these kind of places where these proteins can interact with one another in specific ways that are going to be mediated by phosphorylation. So though we talk about like the SH2 domain as being like binding phosphorylated sites, remember that it's not only just that one phosphocyte that's going to be important for distinguishing between different proteins, there's going to be a lot of interactions. Um, and so, but by having this one like place where it can kind of recognize phosphorylated versus not phosphorylated, you can therefore regulate when things are bound where. Um, so you bring things together, say only when they're going to, when they're in the phosphorylated or the not phosphorylated form. So RAS, um, remember we said RAS is one of those G proteins. So in this signaling pathway of insulin signaling through RAS, we are using a G protein, but we're not using a G protein coupled receptor. We're not, our G protein is not directly attached to our receptor and it's monomeric instead of being heterotrimeric. So you can see that basically RAS is down the line from our receptor um, connected through the IRS1, which is bound to GREB2 and which is bound to SOS which was going to be bound to our RAS. Now RAS, you might have heard about because it's going to be very important in the context of cancer. Mutations in um, RAS that like eliminate its GTP as activity um, are going to cause it to be remain constitutively active or constantly active 
Um, these sorts of mutation occur in about 25% of human cancers. You can also get mutations in um, gaps. So those proteins that were actually um, going to cause the G protein to, um, to activate its GTPase activity. Um, so basically the mutation in RAS itself can alter the G natural GTPase, like the intrinsic GTPase activity of the G protein. But you can also have mutations in the regulatory proteins that regulate the G proteins, such as this tumor suppressor gene, NF1. So NF1 encodes a gap, which causes RAS to stay active for an extended period if you have a mutation that's going to inactivate that NF1. When we talk about a tumor suppressor gene, basically that's a gene whose normal function is to kind of like keep a check on cell growth. If you have a mutation in one of those, well, now you're going to have, a, you're removing the breaks. There are also proteins that we can call like oncogenes or proto-oncogenes. If the gene, the normal gene would be a proto-oncogene and then it's mutated, it becomes an oncogene. Um, and these sorts of genes are things that are going to kind of stimulate growth division, this sorts of thing. So that was one pathway that we could go with the insulin receptor, where we had this adaptive proteins, the RAS activating protein, the RAS, the MAP kinase, 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 the MAP kinase, kinase, the MAP kinase, and then into this nucleus and affecting things. But we also have insulin receptors or other types of, of um, protein tyrosine kinases, um, tyrosine kinase receptors that are able to actually act through a different pathway. Um, and so they can actually act through that same phospholipase C pathway that we saw before. Additionally, insulin can act through this PI3K pathway. Basically, in this case, we still have our key player, this IRS1. Remember that IRS1 was getting phosphorylated by our insulin receptor. Here, once phosphorylated, it's associated with this GREB2 kind of like scaffolding protein, which is associated with SOS, which activated RAS. In the case of this other pathway, here what's going to happen is that I phosphorylated IRS1 is going to interact with this PI3K. So IRS1, once it's phosphorylated, well now it can bind to PI3K. When you see a K, think kinase, this is going to be a kinase. It has an SH2 domain that's able to bind to the phosphorylated IRS1 and get activated. Once activated, well here it can basically phosphorylate PIP2. PIP2 is phosphatidylinositol 4,5-bisphosphate, which is one of our phospholipids. PI3K is basically able to phosphorylate that to give you PIP3. Don't confuse this with IP3. This is still like a full phospholipid, but it has a third phosphate group on this, um, on this phosphatidylinositol head. And once it's phosphorylated, well, now it can bind to PKB. Another K, another kinase, we've got protein kinase B. Protein kinase B is going to bind to PIP3, um, and it's going to be phosphorylated by another kinase, which is called PDK1. Um, and then this is going to be acti fully activated. Now, this PKB is going to phosphorylate a protein called GSK3. Why do we care about GSK3? Well, GSK3's normal role is to regulate this um, glycogen synthase. Um, and so glycogen synthase, synthase making um, glycogen, that's, remember that's our storage unit for glucose. So we can kind of build, um, build glycogen from glucose and help you store glucose. Let's think about what would happen if we had insulin. When do we have insulin released? Well, we have insulin released if we have like had a big meal or we have a bunch of glucose. Um, basically, it tells our cells to let in that glucose and starts like making um, and like storing it and using it and things like this, or I guess storing it. We wouldn't want to basically break down glycogen to make more glucose if there's plenty of glucose around. Instead, if there's a lot of glucose around, we're going to want to store that. And so we're going to want to make glycogen in the response to insulin. So in the response to epinephrine, remember, we said we wanted to kind of like break down glycogen. In the response to insulin, we're going to want to build up glycogen. So what we're going to want to do is we're going to want to have our, our glycogen synthase be active. Glycogen synthase is going to be regulated. Its activity is regulated by this kinase called GSK3. GSK3, when it's active, it's going to phosphorylate glycogen synthase. So I know that a lot of times we talk about phosphorylation as activating things, 
But in this case, phosphorylation is actually going to inactivate our glycogen synthase. Once it's inactive, it can't make glycogen. So we have, if we have GSK3 active, well, our glycogen synthase is going to be inactive. But if we inactivate GSK3, well, now we prevent it from inactivating GS, which means we can make glycogen. So PKB, what it's going to do is it's going to inactivate GSK3, um, and therefore it's going to turn the um, turn the brakes off of the of the brakes on the glycogen maker. So it's like a complicated pathway, um, and there, but at the end result, you get glycogen made. Also, what happens is that that PKB, remember it's a kinase, it can phosphorylate. It doesn't just have to phosphorylate a single thing. It can, it's an enzyme, it can phosphorylate over and over and over again, and it can phosphorylate different molecules. And so each kinase is going to have like specific molecules that'll phosphorylate. They have to have like that consensus sequence and everything, but they can still be multiple proteins that they're going to phosphorylate. In the case of PKB, one of the proteins that it's going to be able to act through are going to be other G proteins. Um, and so we have these, you can't escape those G proteins in signaling. Um, in this case, we have RAC1, um, RC1, and RAB. Basically, what, long story short, what they're going to do is they're going to cause the movement of these GLUT4, these glucose channels, um, from these like internal membranes to the surface of the cell, allowing glucose to be taken in. So basically, if you want to think, if you think about it, if you want to be able to take glucose into the, like regulate how glucose gets into your cells, you, one way is by regulating how much of the glucose receptors and transporters are on the surface of the cell. But actually going and making those proteins and those transporters um, is going to take time. If you want to be able to respond more quickly, you're going to want to have them pre-made. You can kind of like have them pre-made and but kind of like held inside the cell in these little kind of membrane pouches. Um, and these internal vesicles can then merge with the membrane once they get the signal. And the signal is going to be relayed through these G proteins, allowing you to move those transporters to the surface and let like, um, glucose in. So those was just, we saw how insulin could lead to these different pathways. And we can also have lots of different receptor tyrosine kinases. So again, insulin is kind of weird or insulin receptor is kind of weird in that it's kind of a constitutive dimer, but most of these are going to be monomers usually. Some examples are these growth factor receptors. Um, so um, the EGFR and this sort of thing, EGFR, um, various receptors. And these are a lot of these are important for controlling cell division. So it's really important that cells tightly control their cell division, or if not, basically you get uncontrolled cell growth, um, which is cancer. So there's different phases of cell division um, to cell division. And basically there are different checkpoints at these different stages. So the cells like only divide if, if when the time's right. But if there are problems with that, then you can get my signaling, you can get um, uncontrolled growth. One way in which cells kind of control things is through phosphorylation via cyclin-dependent protein kinases, or CDKs, um, which are made in response to growth factor-based signaling. So you have these growth factors that are going to lead to, through receptor tyrosine kinases, to one of those like MAPK cascades. Um, they cause things like the phosphorylation of these proteins, June and FOS, in the nucleus, which are then going to activate transcript this transcription factor which are going to regulate the making of those cyclins and those CDKs, um, enzymes for DNA synthesis, and cause the cells to go from GS, um, from G1 to this S phase. So basically here in this S phase, they're making those, that DNA, they're preparing to divide. Um, and so basically these signaling factors are going to help tell it to divide. And you can imagine that you could have mutations in all sorts of different places that could therefore cause this to happen. Um, and so basically there are all sorts of different, um, different types of receptor tyrosine kinases, and they'll have different substrate specificities. So they'll bind to different types of primary messengers. Some of them actually don't have a, like a known recept, a known um, ligand. And, or some of them, we don't think they actually have a ligand at all. And so there's this one called HER2, um, and so basically HER2, you might've heard about it in the context of like breast cancer. 
PER2 is one of those ones that doesn't need a ligand to activate it, but it does need to be form a dimer. And so normally you don't have enough, you don't have a lot of HER2. And so you're not forming any of these like homo, many of homodimers. But what happens, um, so those homodimers, they wouldn't need any ligand to be activated. But what could happen is basically often this HER2 is going to team up with another RTK, which did need a ligand. So you still had this ligand activation. In the case of overexpression of HER2, however, so if cells are making a lot of it, such as cancer cells that overexpress HER2, well, now they're able to make a lot of this functional dimer that doesn't need a ligand to be activated. If it doesn't need the ligand to be activated, well, now it's going to be like constitutively active if there's enough of it where you form this dimers. So that's one of the common ways in which um, you, in which one of the common mutations associated with, with breast cancer is like an overexpression of HER2. And there are antibody treatments like Herceptin that actually go and try to block this, um, block the, block this receptor so that it can't be activated. You can't get that activity. There's also a lot of crosstalk between the pathways. So that insulin receptor, it can also go and like that, um, it can phosphorylate the beta adrenergic receptor. Um, IRS1, that was acting through PKB, which could um, phosphorylate the beta adrenergic receptor. All those things that are basically able to kind of control the internalization of those receptors. But you can also have it basically, the insulin receptor can phosphorylate a different site on the GPCR, which can then lead it to kind of be a building off point for one of those MAP cascades. So lots of crosstalk between the pathways, which a lot of it depending on kind of like what's hooked up where. But that is basically a broad overview of signal transduction. We have those GPCRs where we have the G protein coupled receptors bound to a heterotrimeric G protein. The G alpha subunit is the one that's going to bind to GDP and exchange it for GTP upon response to the primary messenger um, that's the signal relayed through the receptor. So the primary messenger, the hormone is going to bind to the receptor, cause the receptor going to cause shape, chain shape. The change shaped receptor is then going to basically cause the G protein to change shape to release its GDP and take up GTP. Once bound to GTP, well now it kind of it kind of exposes a binding site for adenylocyclase. And so it's gonna go, it's gonna ditch that be, um, those beta and the gamma subunits, go and find the adenylocyclase and activate it. Adenylocyclase is then able to produce cyclic AMP, our second messenger, which can then go activate things like protein kinase A, which can activate other things. Alternatively, it can go in and can activate protein lipase C, which is basically going to lead to the production of IP3 and DAG, which are then going to act through a different pathway. We can also um, have our receptor tyrosine kinases. Here, these are going to function as dimers. The ligand binds, activates autophosphorylation. Those dimers are going to basically phosphorylate one another and lead to signaling cascades through kinases, typically as well as pathways that connect through other lipid-mediated functions. We also have our gated ion channels where things are going to open up in response to a stimulus. And we have things like steroids, which can just go directly into the nucleus and bind to receptors there to alter transcription. Long story short, this was a lot of detail, a lot more than you need to know. But if you just wanted some cool facts about biochemistry, that's that. There's still a lot, 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 lot more that I didn't go into. But I basically, by kind of having an idea about the general logic, you can then go and look at pathway diagrams and kind of try to figure out what's going on and what might happen if you have mutations at different points, if you have agonists or antagonists, places you might want to see regulation, um, and then all that good stuff.